I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. With liberty and justice. With liberty for all. and justice for all. And justice, 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 justice. Justice has been held high in America from its very founding. In light of recent trends, however, I've begun to wonder on what foundation? In order for there to be stability in law, there has to be one ultimate standard. And that ultimate standard traditionally has been the Constitution of the United States. I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a Constitution in the year 2012. If judges continue to call the Constitution inadequate for modern society, that foundation could soon be lost. Then, what would we look to? I mean, if we go back to the founding of the United States, these guys, they knew what the Bible said and they were trusting God to found them, their country, and they stood on the authority of God and His Word. The Bible has been disregarded by many judges, and they are now working to remove all reminders of God's law. Cases of the Ten Commandments being dragged out of our buildings or scrubbed off our walls, or children being told they can't pray in school, when the Constitution becomes relative, when our right to life becomes relative, literally, people die. Listen, if we don't shape up, our nation is gone. So what defines justice in America today? And is it truly just? The ideal role of the court is to look to the United States Constitution, or if we're talking about a state court, the Constitution of the state, and determine whether a statute, or a local ordinance, or a local policy of government is consistent with the Constitution. And if a law passed by Congress, or by the legislature, or by the local school board, or the city council, is inconsistent with the Constitution, then it is the responsibility of the court to strike that law down as unconstitutional. And that being the case, the court becomes the guardian of the rights of the people, particularly the rights of minorities. I say especially the rights of minorities because usually majorities can take care of themselves. It's minorities especially that need the court's protection. Our justice system, and interestingly, I. Uh, I find more and more we refer to it as our legal system. And I don't think that that's really by accident, that uh, we see it as more of a legal system than a justice system, just following the law and, um, and not really getting at the, the greater issue of, of justice in a particular situation. Injustice is often done in our criminal uh, courts uh, because we've developed all kinds of technical rules that oftentimes become hoops through which prosecutors have to jump that frustrates the purpose of justice, but uh, it, it's, it's consistent with what the legal process uh, would require. So one of the things we need to appreciate about what the justice system was intended to do was one, do justice between parties who had a dispute, whether it was in the civil area or in the criminal area, but it was to do justice between those uh, parties. In fact, the U.S. Constitution requires that there must be a case or controversy at issue 
for the courts even to have jurisdiction to be able to hear a case. In the book of Isaiah, we read, The Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. You see, there are all three branches and functions of government combined together. The Lord is our king, executive, the Lord is our lawgiver, legislative, the Lord is our judge, judicial. You see, all of those three functions of government combined together. The function of the legislature is to determine the policy for the nation. That's the function of Congress. The purpose of the president or of the governor is to carry out the policies established by the legislature. Sometimes we think it's the other way around, that the president is effectively a king and the Congress is just his rubber stamps, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. The function of the judiciary is to interpret and apply the law. In other words, Congress makes the laws, the president enforces the law, the court interprets the law. Now because of this, Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers said that the court, the judiciary, is the least dangerous branch of government because he assumed that they would limit their functions to just interpreting the laws adopted by Congress and interpreting the Constitution. What I think Hamilton failed to realize is that the day would come when judges would not consider themselves bound by the intent of the framers or the plain meaning of the words, but instead would follow what we call today the living constitution philosophy, which is a very dangerous idea. The idea is that the constitution changes its meaning with time, but what it really means is that the judges reinterpret the constitution to mean whatever they want it to mean. Sometimes people will say the constitution is irrelevant, and it's very seldom in an election debate that you hear people talking about the constitution, but that really should be the threshold question on every issue that comes before Congress. The problem we're having though is that Instead of simply protecting the rights that are guaranteed by the federal and state constitutions, we find courts moving into an area of social activism and judicial activism, and they are striking down laws of Congress and of the state and local governments, not because they violate the plain wording of the constitution, but because they are contrary to what the court wishes the constitution said, or what the court tries to extrapolate out of the Constitution through penumbras and emanations and this living Constitution approach. And when the court does that, the court has abandoned its function as a judicial body and become a super legislature instead. That's the direction I think the courts are going today and in the process. They have gone way beyond what their function was supposed to be. They are becoming more than just administrators of justice, but becoming therapeutic. They're trying to shape and mold people into doing what is good. Uh, you know, one of the popular things in our culture is to create drug courts where we try to get people off drugs, and that's a good idea. But we need to ask ourselves, can a justice system really do that? Or is a justice system designed to decide this was right behavior and that was wrong behavior and here is the sentence as a result of it? But the therapy uh, cannot be meted out by a justice system. And when the justice system begins to be used for things that it's not designed for, Will we not only mess up therapy, but will we mess up our justice system? You may recall Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, kind of a sequel to Alice in Wonderland, and in Through the Looking Glass, you recall when Humpty Dumpty makes the statement, when I use a word, it means exactly what I want it to mean nothing more and nothing less. And Alice asks, the question is, can you make words mean different things? And Humpty Dumpty answers, the question is, who is to be master? That is all. 
If judges are free to make the words of the Constitution mean whatever they want them to mean, then they've become our masters. But looking at this term that we hear used so often today, social justice, the plain fact is the term means just about anything that the person using the term wants it to mean. Many times we see the term being used to mean that those who earn less money than others should be given some kind of subsidy to equalize that difference. This concept of social justice is um, fascinating to me in a sense um, because really there just is a notion of justice. That's all there is, justice. Now, whether we're doing justice within our society is, is a legitimate question. For example, are our laws oppressing the poor? Um, that's a legitimate question to ask. But oftentimes what lurks behind this notion of social justice is really this concept of fairness, that somehow it's, it's not fair to you to have this and me not to have that. I've heard it said that it is as much an injustice to make unequals equal as it is to make equals unequal. But I hear that term used many times for redressing any situation in which one person makes more money than another, or in which one person may have less social status than another. And I find the term a very, very vacuous and nebulous term, and I try to avoid the term. One of the great tensions in the law is how do I encourage good without doing evil? How do I punish evil without doing evil? Uh, for example, we would say that stealing is wrong. But within this lurky concept of, of fairness, uh, we say, well, some people don't have as much as other people have, and somehow that's not fair. So we're going to take from some people to give to other people so that things are more fairly and equally distributed, and that's somehow social justice. But if we believe that stealing is wrong, then were we not stealing to take from this person to give to another? In trying to do a good, let's say, we've actually committed an evil. The law cannot do an evil to promote a good. That's the ends justify the means. There's actually a verse in 1 Timothy that says, we know that the law is good if it's used lawfully. Uh, the law can be used unlawfully. Uh, the law can be used in unlawful ways. And uh, so we have to find a way to, 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 to help the poor without stealing, without doing injustice uh, to the others. Sometimes we use social justice in the sense of what is sometimes called positive rights. Now let's explain what we mean by this. There is a sense in which the commands of Scripture are mostly negative commands. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And you might say the negative commands of Scripture create certain rights. From the command, thou shalt not kill, we can infer a right to life. From the command, thou shalt not steal, we can infer a right to property. And those, we might say, are negative rights and negative commands and negative laws. And negative laws are much more compatible with freedom than positive laws. Because when you have laws expressed in the negative, thou shalt not, the meaning is you are free to do whatever you want so long as it's not one of those categories where we said thou shalt not. When the law says thou shalt, that means your freedom is greatly limited. You have to do that and nothing else. In other words, your freedom is much more limited by positive commands than by negative commands. And you might say that the rights that are conveyed 
by the Constitution and by the Bill of Rights are generally negative rights. What they mean is the government cannot prohibit you from doing certain things. But right now we're seeing a movement in law in America today, just as it's been going on in Europe for decades before, and you will find very often that America is the elephant's graveyard where failed social programs from Europe go to die. That after Europe has tried something and found that it doesn't work, we take it up over here. But we find here that we're talking about positive law and positive rights. And by positive law and positive rights, we mean, for example, the right to a minimum income or the right to guaranteed health care or the right to a guarantee of a job or guaranteed housing. I would say that the Constitution guarantees to me the right to go out and seek a job. It doesn't guarantee that I'm going to have one. It guarantees me the right to seek to buy property. It doesn't promise me that I'm going to have property. It guarantees to me the right to try to work as hard as I can to earn money so that I can provide for health care for my family. It doesn't guarantee to me that I'm going to have health care. But as we're moving over toward positive rights, that's many times used in the sense of social justice. In other words, social justice can mean so many things to different people. And the way it is most commonly used today, it is used for a, social, a certain brand of social justice that many of us probably wouldn't agree with at all. Our government has embraced concepts that have begun to infringe upon religious liberty. Uh, for example, hate crimes would be one of those situations where <clears throat> we have come across this notion that there are some crimes that entail a, a, a kind of hatred that we want to do our best to stamp out by means of the law to, to rid ourselves of these kinds of certain hatred that are, 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 are viewed um, as unacceptable in our current society. Well, our views of what is acceptable and unacceptable ultimately flow out of our moral base, which flows out of our religious conceptions, whether that's um, about God or that there is no God. Hate crimes are a matter of great concern on both sides. On the one hand, the things that we would call hate crimes are certainly things that we would abhor. But usually, when something is designated a hate crime using the language of today, it means a crime that was motivated by special animosity toward the victim of the crime based upon the victim's race or gender or possibly religion or some other feature about that particular person. When we're talking about a hate crime, we're signaling out particular animosity toward a particular person because of the criteria that I've just established. What has begun to happen is that rather than acknowledging that all crimes are motivated by some kind of hatred of the victim, that there are uh, especially uh, hateful sorts of crimes which uh, can only really be evaluated on the basis of what we say or what we believe. Um, and, and so consequently, what ha has happened with hate crimes is that they are used to squelch the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, particularly with respect to the expression of that religion. And we have to appreciate that that, that also changes this notion of justice. Uh, with, with hate crimes, for example, particularly uh, in the state in which I live, where uh, doing certain things, if they're deemed hateful, um, justify a, a harsher criminal penalty, you have unequal justice. You can have two victims who are, uh, suffer the exact same crime in the exact same way, but uh, one perpetrator is treated more harshly than the other, though their act was exactly the same. I don't see how you can say from the perspective of the victim 
that one is entitled to more justice, essentially by having a harsher sentence imposed upon the perpetrator than the other. Another thing about it is that it makes hate crimes very selective. Let's say somebody kills another person not because of animosity toward that person's race or gender or sexual orientation, but rather because he hates that person because the person is overweight or maybe because he's overweight and that person isn't or because of that person's complexion or that person's political affiliation or many, many other conditions that we might consider, doesn't like the color of car the person drives or many things like that, that's not a hate crime. In other words, we're very selective in what types of animosity make up hate crimes and what types do not. I think it leads to a lot of searching into a person's motives, a person's beliefs and the like. And for that reason, I think the whole idea of hate crimes is unnecessary and I think it's dangerous. We already have severe penalties established for the types of things that we're seeking to denominate as hate crimes. Such crimes are already assault or aggravated assault or assault with a deadly weapon or murder. And I don't think we need to add this additional factor. We just need to enforce the laws we have right now. We've confused the elements of a crime with what we watch on all of our law and justice programs on television. Uh, and in those shows, what we often hear about is the motive. Well, why would this person have committed this crime? What would be their motive? People don't commit crimes for no reason. There's always some reason. Well, in the history of jurisprudence, in criminal jurisprudence, um, motive is, is what might be used in an effort to narrow down the field of potential perpetrators to help identify and find the person who's committed the crime. But the motive has never been an element of the crime. For instance, we've always looked at whether an act was intentional, whether an act was uh, uh, reckless, whether an act was negligent. Uh, or whether an act was just simply an accident, let's say. And, and those were elements of the crime by which we determined the severity of the punishment, that we would obviously punish something that's intentional more harshly than we would something that is simply negligent. Well, we've confused that notion with the idea of motive. And we never said, well, if the intention was good to steal from you in order to provide uh, necessary drugs for your sick child, then that's okay. But if your motive was to buy drugs for illicit purposes to get high, then that's a bad motive for an intentional act. The law said we don't really care what the motive is, just whether it was intentional or not, or accidental or not, or negligent. So we've confused uh, television jurisprudence and courtroom programs with what the law actually can look at. And it is hard to judge the motives of the heart. And from the Christian perspective, I would say that only God can judge the motives of the heart. In fact, there's an interesting story in Luke where a man comes to Jesus and is fussing because his brother uh, is not rightly dividing the inheritance with him. And interestingly, Jesus' response is, are there not judges to handle that kind of stuff? to decide whether the inheritance is being divided according to the law. But Jesus says, beware of greed that is lurking in your heart. See, Jesus could get at what was behind the question. Oftentimes, we don't really know what is behind the question. Uh, sometimes we don't even know what motivates our own actions. Uh, so that's the problem in part with hate crimes, is we confuse motivation with the elements of the crime, and we try to determine what a motivation might be when really our ability to, to truly judge rightly, the motivations within the heart, uh, is, is very hard. The heart is deceitful. Who can know it? Not long ago, a Supreme Court justice made the statement that nothing is more certain in today's changing world than that there are no absolutes. 
I don't know if he even considered the contradiction of what he was saying, that that itself is an absolute. And when you consider moral relativism, the whole idea of relativism is often presented in the academic community today as though it is the one absolute. And that tolerance has one limit, and that's that we will not tolerate those whom we consider to be intolerant. In order for there to be stability in law, there has to be one ultimate standard, and that ultimate standard traditionally has been the Constitution of the United States. Now, I think we need to recognize, too, that the Constitution was drafted by men who came mostly out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, one thing, or let's say two things that they would agree upon, one would be a high view of God and his law. The other would be a low view of man and his nature. When I speak about a high view of God and his law, we look to the Declaration of Independence, for example, which states that we are entitled to our independence by the laws of nature and of nature's God, and goes on to say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are evolved equal, except it doesn't say evolved, it says created equal, and that they are endowed not by their government with certain negotiable privileges, but by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And the idea that there is one God who is the source of governmental authority and who is the source of human rights was very central in the Founding Fathers' thinking. When you consider it, the idea of one God, ethical monotheism as we would put it, means that there is one standard. And one thing that is probably unique about the Judeo-Christian view of God and his law is that God is an ethical God. He isn't just some whimsical God who just adopts certain principles, certain commands, just because it suits his fancy. Rather, God is a God of justice. He is a God of righteousness. And his commands are moral and ethical commands. And the fact that there is one God means then that there is one standard. If you are a polytheist, as were most of the nations that surrounded Israel, and as was the case with those of Greece and those of Rome, there is no one standard. It may be that the god Marduk has given one set of commands, or the god Isis has given another command, or Zeus has given still another, or Odin has given still another. But ethical monotheism, the idea that there is one god, and one standard of ethics that that God has promulgated because those are central to his character. That is the source of unity in principles of law and government. And without that, I think civilization is ultimately going to fall apart. And moral relativism is a concept that never works in practice because ultimately there is going to be something that the moral relativist is going to say that he will not tolerate. It either leads to anarchy or it leads to a whole new form of totalitarianism. And either way, it is no basis for building a free society. To evaluate how to apply the truth in a particular situation is uh, requires judgment and discernment and wisdom, but it's not a denial of the existence of that truth. Moral relativism would really deny the existence of that truth. And the more we reject um, higher law, the more that we reject a, a moral foundation for our law, then the, m the more fluid our law becomes. And so when you have moral relativism uh, creeping into our courts, then it, it really erodes why we even have a, a criminal justice system, why we even have laws. Uh, is it just simply because a majority of the people agree something is wrong? Uh, well, for some people, that is, that's it. And that, that moral relativism, it, it can't last. It does not work as a society because uh, if 51% of the people change their mind and suddenly murder is okay, well, on what basis do you have to fall back on to say that, no, that's wrong, we can't do that? And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in the generations coming up where nothing is inherently wrong, nothing is inherently right. 
and it's really whatever you feel. So you go before a judge who is not going by the law, but he's going by what he feels. And of course that changes from day to day, minute by minute, hour by hour. And our founding fathers understood that, that you can't have a republic as ours. You can't have a constitutional republic without morality and virtue uh, of the people. So as the people deteriorate uh, in their own morality, so too will our government, so too will our, co will our country deteriorate as well. When we think about the purpose of the law, um, Scripture says that the purpose of the law is to commend, encourage the good, and to punish what's evil. My own experience would show that we in fact do know that, that that is one of those truths that we can't not know. In my experience as a state legislator for 12 years, I never had anybody come into the office and say, David, this is a really bad public policy. It'll accomplish all kinds of bad things. It will encourage evil. Uh, it will restrain good. And I hope you will vote for it. Never. Everybody always came in and said that this policy is good. Or they came in and said this policy is bad. But nobody ever wanted the law to um, affirm evil and punish good. The question is who gets to define good and evil? And that's where the existence of truth and moral absolutes becomes so important. Because otherwise we're left to determine our own sense of truth and who is to say that the truth that I espouse is not any better or is uh, not any worse than the truth you espouse. There's no standard by which to then judge those two people that come into my office. Well, they can't both be right. So what is that standard we use by which to judge the rightness or wrongness of a law? When the Constitution becomes relative, when our right to life becomes relative, literally people die. This is the consequence of moral relativism in our courts and infecting our constitutional interpretation. So it's not just an academic exercise to say, well, you know, we're, we're going to lose uh, our morality and, and things are going to be a little bad. Fifty million children have been killed because of moral relativism and the right to life. Uh, so to me, it's a, it's a very real and it's a very deadly problem that we're facing in America and we've got to get back to the idea that it's always wrong to take the life of an innocent human being regardless of how old they are, regardless of location, and regardless of whether they're born. As we look into our culture that denies the existence of truth, we have to realize that often the excuses and the rationales that are being given for behavior are really an acknowledgement of an existing truth they just think that there is an exception by which that truth doesn't apply to them in their particular circumstances. When we're in a culture where people have denied God and denied Him as the ultimate authority, by default, what are you left with? You're left with man being that ultimate authority, whether individually or collectively, and man gets elevated to that particular position. Uh, in uh, philosophical terms, this is actually classed as humanism, and that is a very common religion in today's day and age. And really what we're seeing in our culture is a battle over different religions. You have people who are standing on the authority of God and His Word, letting God be the ultimate lawgiver, and then we have people rejecting that, and they're the ones saying, that man is the ultimate authority. Man is the one who can determine truth. The scripture also says, woe to those who begin to call evil good and call good evil. Because eventually, the people will come to associate with the law that evil is good and good is evil. Because we would intuitively think if the law allows this, well, it must be okay because surely the law would restrain or prohibit that which is bad. And because we intuitively know those things, uh, the law then begins to shape our understanding of right and wrong over a period of time. Even the scripture says, I wouldn't have known um, about coveting but for the law. In Galatians we're told that the law was our tutor, our teacher, to bring us to salvation in that by its righteous judgments, essentially, we knew right from wrong and we knew we committed wrong. So. That's something that's been forgotten, not just in the culture at large, 
but within the church that what our civil laws say are important. We do not love our neighbor well if we allow the, the law to teach the mass of our young people, for example, that promiscuity is an acceptable form of sexual expression. According to scripture, it is not. But what begins to happen as our laws teach that to our children, they begin to see promiscuity is right. Then we begin to see disease and we begin to see pregnancy. And then as Christians, we wring our hands and lament that, oh, this is so awful, all these diseases and all these pregnancies among our young people. And we just need to have more crisis pregnancy centers and whatever else it might be. But we never think about changing the law. We never think about the fact that the law is teaching them that evil is good. And so, having been taught that, they engage in that behavior. And it leads to horrible negative consequences. I often like to think of what happens within the church by this picture of, of, of people, of families, of individuals walking along a cliff. And that cliff is culture. And, and what happens is people fall off of that cliff. Within the church, we're so quick to, to go down to the bottom of the cliff and build hospitals to care for those who've been wounded and torn apart by the culture, by their fall off the cliff. But we give little thought to, and in fact, often in our churches, uh, intentionally restrain from talking about building a fence at the top of the cliff to keep them from falling. And that fence is what the law is. It restrains evil. And the church needs to remember that it is not either or, it is both and. We must continue to build the hospitals at the foot of the cliff for those who fall off. But we can't not build the fence at the top to restrain others from falling. We must do both simultaneously. As Christians, we have to acknowledge that that civil law is not going to save anybody, nor is it going to make anybody righteous. But we do have to appreciate, even as it says in Scripture, the law does help instruct and inform our moral values. So what begins to happen if the laws do not reflect God's righteous standards is that more people who will never enter the church door will be seduced into believing that certain behaviors are good and acceptable. They'll not be confronted with the fact that they're engaging in behaviors that are wrong. And we know ultimately that salvation begins with an understanding prompted by the Spirit of God that what we're doing is wrong. So it is important, I would submit, to create an atmosphere that, and a fertile ground for evangelism that our laws reflect God's righteous standards when it comes to moral conduct and behavior uh, because that civil law reflecting that can be used to convince and convict us of our own sin, our own fallenness, and our need for a Savior. Uh, the biggest problem in life is, is sin, really, when you come right down to it. Uh, wh why do we kill people? Why do we commit adultery? Uh, why do we do anything that's wrong? Well, because we're sinners, that's why. And we need a Savior, and Jesus is our Savior. If we look back at Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, what the Lord did, the Lord sacrificed animals to cover that sin. Now, that wasn't enough to take away that sin. It wasn't enough to pay for the penalty for that sin because animals are not infinite. All they could do was cover it. Noah offered sacrifices. Abraham did. The Israelites did. And that's all pointing to Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate payment for sin. Now, why is Christ the ultimate payment for sin? See, here's what it is. The punishment from an infinite God is an infinite punishment. So we needed a perfect, infinite sacrifice that could take the punishment from the infinite Father. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is infinite, he could take that punishment. This is why Christ stepped into history to become a man. He became a man. He took the punishment that we all deserve. The infinite son took the infinite punishment from the infinite father. He basically satisfied the wrath of God. And you know what? He offers the free gift of salvation from that. Now, in today's culture, there are so many people who miss what the gospel is all about. Friends, it's all about Christ. You see, he covered it. He covered the fine for sin.
So what's going on in today's culture, not just in the United States, but if we look around at various other cultures, or let's even look at cultures back in the past. Many of these nations have came and went. Uh, political schemes have, have been there and have, and have uh, long gone. Something has happened. In fact, we've seen uh, moral issues pop up in these various cultures, and they've came and went. Why is it that God and His Word is the only absolute standard to define right and wrong, to define things like moral issues, to define things like justice? Well, it's because God is the only one who doesn't change. But we're in a culture where people have said, let's keep God out of it. And when you keep God out of it, God is no longer that authority when it comes to moral issues, when it comes to justice. And you know what? We start to see it shift. We start to see it change. And you know what? This is what we've seen in cultures past. Many great nations at one point have fallen, and now there's an entirely different uh, political realm there. And you know what? They struggle as well. You know what? If a culture doesn't start with God and His Word, really, where are they going to go when it comes to moral issues? Our culture is changing. Uh, what used to be uh, sin is no longer sin. And uh, I think that we are in trouble morally in the United States of America. And if we keep on going, there's no reason why God would salvage the United States of America. Other nations did the same thing that we're doing. Rome at one time did the same thing that we're doing. Rome was guilty of excess homosexuality and all the other, other drunkenness and all that. There's no reason why God should say, well, America, you're so wonderful and you're so precious. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let anything hurt you. Listen, if we don't shape up, our nation is gone. I won't see it. I'm 93 years old. I won't see it, but my grandchildren probably will see it. And I think we need to be very careful about where we see our justice system going because eventually uh, we could get to the point, and this sounds uh, apocalyptic, but where uh, we begin to say, you know, believing certain things, you folks who are Christians, we need to help you think differently about it. And, and if you're willing to get therapy, then we won't punish you. So uh, you go through this diversity training and we won't punish you. But if you don't, then we're going to have to punish you. Well, either the behavior is right or it's wrong and it should be punished or not punished. But beginning to use punishment as a means to encourage therapy, um, to encourage changing of, of minds and, and understandings, uh, that's not really the purpose of the justice system. But we see this notion creeping into our justice system and throughout our whole culture. We're seeing it now even in our colleges, where if you want to have certain kinds of degree programs like psychology or social work, you have to believe certain things. And if not, they're saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Uh, you want to stay in the program? You want to be licensed? You're going to have to go through some diversity training. You're going to have to learn to think differently. The way you think isn't right anymore. So we're dealing not just with religious liberty when we remove God from our public square, but it also removes our civil liberty. Because if government is the only thing that gives you rights, that if they don't come from God, as our founders believed in the Declaration, then only government gives you rights. And if the government gives you rights to life, liberty, property, etc., then the government can take them away when they decide to do so. George Washington said in his farewell address, of all of the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and to cherish them. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life? If the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. In R.J. Rush Dooney's book, Law and Liberty, he says, take away God's standard of righteousness from the law and you strip the law of justice. This is a critical time for our nation. As the rule of law is balanced against the rule of lawlessness, as our representation in government is endangered, and as people offer their liberty for promises of security and stability, is there anything we can do? It's important that we study our Constitution, that we study our American history, that we see what the founders had in store for us. They gave us a good thing. And like Benjamin Franklin said, they've given us a republic 
if we can keep it, and I'm afraid we're not keeping it very well. So every generation needs to study the Constitution for itself, needs to pass along those principles of liberty within law to the, the succeeding generations, and I think we're losing that, especially in the modern era. Our reliance as Christians should ultimately and finally be in God, in His provision, in His protection. We have to recognize that in our form of government, God has extended to us, delegated to us, a measure of His authority in the realm of civil government that ultimately and finally comes from God and to whom we will give an account for the exercise of that authority. We think of that with respect to everything else God entrusts to us, our time, our talent, our treasure, that we should steward that. But what about the authority that God has given us in the, in the uh, civil realm, in the civil government realm? Should we not steward it as well? And, and to exercise that, in author that authority in the civil realm, to stand up for our liberties as Christians, is, is consistent with good stewardship. It's consistent with trying to uh, create an atmosphere in which the gospel can go forward with as few hindrances as possible. When you look at what Christ said to the disciples at the end of Matthew, He basically gave the Great Commission, go into all the world preaching the gospel, discipling people. You know what? We, we've kind of lost that as Christians in many of our churches. Uh, you know, we'll go out and we'll preach the gospel, but we don't really disciple people. We don't get them in the Word of God. What we found is cultures change because of heart changes. When the people start to change, you know what? We're going to see that reflection in the government. And what we've seen uh, in a reversal trend in the past 50 years or so, we've really started to see many people give up Christianity and start to buy into things like evolution, naturalism, or other uh, pagan forms of ideas. And uh, as soon as that happens, you're going to see that loss of Christian morality. And you know what? It's from a Christian perspective that we have things like liberties and rights. In an evolutionary perspective, if there's no God, who cares about rights? Who cares about liberties? You see, if everybody's just animals, there is no such thing as right and wrong. So one of the first things we need to do is we need to vote. We need to vote for the right people. But the other thing is we need to get the message of the gospel out to people and we need to start training them and discipling them. Most churches today do not address any of the issues taking place in our culture if in any way they touch upon that which is political or governmental. And most of those issues do. But what happens is, th those issues, we say, oh, that touches politics, so we shouldn't talk about it, because that brings politics into the church. So we have Christians who go out here, and they don't think biblically about what they're doing. They don't think of the authority they hold. Uh, the power of the ballot box is ultimately coming from God and having to give an account for it. And so we just willy-nilly are out here doing all kinds of things that do not promote righteousness and, and justice. Uh, so the church needs to begin equipping the saints to understand uh, the issues of our day from the perspective of God's standard and encouraging us to then go out and exercise the authority we've been given in, in ways that promote that. Uh, that's, I think, the most important thing that the church can do. And because of our form of government, if we're doing that well, eventually our laws and our policies will reflect those values. At one time, they did. We can uh, exert an influence on society. What's happening today is because we are silent and we are many times weak in our faith, society is dictating to us and they are governing how we live in society. It ought to be the other way around. We ought to be the salt of the earth and we ought to be the light of the world and we ought to be the ones causing a change in society. I think oftentimes within the conservative evangelical church, we've gotten this notion of truth down pretty well, but not grace in the way we present it. And I think we need to remember that uh, truth without grace 
is, is harsh. It's mean, in a sense. But grace, without truth, which is what is espoused by our culture of tolerance and by the liberal churches, is, is meaningless. If there is no truth, then there's nothing that could be offended that would call for grace. So we must balance these two. I think where we're headed in our culture in America is that we are going to find that standing for biblical principles is going to become harder and harder. And we're going to have to come to grips with who this Jesus really is and whether or not there is anything in this life we could lose, including our wealth and our reputation, that would justify denying Him. We're going to have to make some tough decisions in America as our culture continues to slide and is Evil is thought of as good, and good is thought of as evil. When we stand for biblical truth, we'll be seen as hateful. And we're going to have to learn to be okay with that. As Christians, we've not been given a spirit of timidity, of fear. In fact, the Scripture says that perfect love casts out fear. When we as Christians find ourselves fearful, we need to begin to ask in that moment, what am I fearful of? Is His love for me, His provision for me, not perfect, not sufficient, such that I have to retreat and I have to be afraid and I therefore need to control the situation and, and in this instance control is being politically correct. We need to stop just saying, hey, we're doing this for family values, we're doing this because of tradition. We need to start saying where uh, this morality comes from. We need to not be afraid to say, hey, it comes from God and His Word. Now, we may have people out there say, oh, hold on a second, that's religion, you know, the government can't have religion. Well, guess what? The government does have religion. When they kick Christianity out of, say, like the classrooms, they didn't kick religion out. They replaced it. They kicked Christianity out and brought in religions like secular humanism. Things like evolution, millions of years, those are aspects to this religion of secular humanism. Even uh, different issues uh, such as Marxism, communism, socialism, things like that, those sorts of issues, those are religious. And what we need to do is we need to recognize, hold it, those are religions too. And it's a battle over religion versus religion. The difference is either God is the ultimate authority or man is the ultimate authority. But then what we need to do is we actually need to speak out against sinful things that are going on there. We need to be preachers of righteousness in the same way that Noah was before the flood. We need to just live the way we believe and, and be Christians and be God-fearing people that's the way we began as Americans, and that's the way we ought to continue. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6 says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time.